Alrighty. I'm back. So, um, I hope you guys didn't miss me too much. If there's anybody out there watching. Um, I'm continuing with the camel spider today. And working on these front legs. So I haven't had a chance to work on this since the last live session because I've been doing a lot of work. So, not much progress in the meantime, but I can show, show you my workflow for dealing with legs. Right now, I'm, these are the front legs. And um, in arachnids, these are called commonly called pedipalps because they kind of function as grabbers as well as legs. So you've got eight legs here and then the pedipalps. And spiders, these can look really, really different. This is not a spider, obviously, but it is an arachnid. So it's, this is the chalicery right here. These are the pedipalps. These are the eyes, adorable as they are. Legs, abdomen, this is the cephalothorax. So working on these right here. And for the most part, they look pretty simple. They're just kind of like clubs. Um, as far as being able to find a decent image of the feet, I don't know about that. You might have to uh, do some digging. But at the very least, I could break out the form. So this is kind of a typical workflow. After I've broken the legs into segments, subdivided them, they've got polygroups. Notice the polygroups are symmetrical across the x-axis. That way I can use mask by polygroup. So I have that here. I don't know if you can see it, but I actually have it on the lower part of my interface. I'm gonna rearrange this so you can see the bottom of the interface a little bit better. So there we go. Mass by polygroups. This is a slider normally found in the brush menu under auto masking. This one right here, one of my favorite settings. So in my custom interface, mildly custom interface, I put the slider right here because I use it a lot. So let's move this back over here and make it a little bit smaller. This is a pure ref, by the way, that I'm using. Um, so I'm going to set mass by polygroups up to 100. And now that means that uh, as I work with these segments, each their own polygroup, if I drag on this one, I can easily make it overlap the other segment. So this is the coaxer right here. I'm not sure if these guys also have a trochanter on their pedipalps, but this is commonly known as the coxa, C-O-X-A. And uh, then we basically have... Typically we would call this then the femur. Sometimes you have another segment, which is the uh, trochanter. Femur, tibia, and the tarsi, the tarsus. So I'm kind of learning about these critters as I go. So I'm using my spider knowledge, but I may be off of my terminology on this particular critter, but probably not. I tend to use the same terminology even for insects, even though the legs might be slightly different. We're all going to be crabs eventually. Apparently, evolution has a fondness for the crab. But we're all crab body plants, so the you know, crab body plant keeps evolving over and over again throughout the history of life on Earth, so eventually we'll all be crab people. That you can be absolutely sure. escape cloth here and uh, kind of make this ridge you commonly see this kind of thing right here even though I'm working on this segment which you can't really see in this image I'm just going to kind of rough these out I should probably double check some of my other reference yeah oh so it looks like there might be another segment there in between the coxa and the femur or that might just be a curve a little bit hard to tell from that image, so let's take a look. And another, this one is gonna, okay, so we got a big coaxer right here. Ah, of course that's blocking it, so I can't really see. Okay, this looks like it might actually have one segment and then another segment and then another segment. Let's take a look at another picture. Yeah, I'm definitely getting the sense that we have a big segment right here 
and then the smaller segment right here, and then we have the femur. So this would be the coxa, this would be the trochanter. So let me check my critter. Did I already put that in there? It looks like I kind of implied it right here, but I don't think I had that big segment. So we're going to call this the trochanter, and I'm going to move it out a little bit, and then we'll, we'll create another segment in a bit for the, for the coxa there at the bottom. So this is why it's always good to constantly check and recheck and reference, just so you know what's going on. And then I do have this in subdivision levels, so I can move this a little bit easier. We might even do a new zero mesh later on. I don't know how much I care about the topology of this one, but it never hurts. Zebra mesh, I love it. I use it all the time. It's my best friend now. <clears throat> right now, I'm not going to worry so much about the topology as you get the shapes. Sometimes the uh, mass by poly groups can get to you. I'm using my uh, Space Mouse Enterprise, which I really enjoy, but I'm still getting used to the, the way I set up the buttons, so sometimes I hit the wrong button by mistake. But it's starting, starting to build up the muscle memory. I do love it, though, because it makes it so easy to examine the model as you work. So now we're going to work on this segment right here, which should be the end of the femur. All right, so let's see if we can find it closer. It's this one right here, so it looks like we have a little bit of a curve in there that we need to build in. Just a slight one. Get my draw size going. Let's push this thing over here. It might look like something other than sausages. seeing anything that's going on in the chat. Yeah, unfortunately I can't see it in the chat messages at the moment. So I apologize. So we need SK cloth to kind of pull this out here and start to create this overlap. Push the ship to click on that and take the clay tubes. I'm just going to build in a little bit of depression here. Dynamic depression. My soul. I know what I want, but I just don't know how to go about getting it. Music, sweet music, cuts from my fingers, fingers. Manic depression and a frustrated mess. Are we 
recently watched, uh, it was on Amazon one of those nights where you're sitting around not knowing what to watch, not knowing what to do, having to put something on in the background. I noticed that they did a biopic of Jimi Hendrix a few years ago, so I thought I'd give it a try. I never really heard of it. I just saw it on Amazon. It was okay. It wasn't great. It was kind of the typical rock and roll biopic, you know. Dude's really good at guitar. He's really famous. He has a girlfriend. Starts messing around. Starts doing drugs. Gets more famous. Does more drugs. I actually stopped watching it because it was annoying. Because I think the thing that they missed, you know, the actor who played Hendrix, and I forget who it was, he was okay. I mean, he did a pretty good Jimi Hendrix impersonation, as impersonations go. He had the mannerisms down and all that kind of stuff. But they missed something really important in that movie that I think is why it wasn't very good. And that was, they left out a very important character. They left out basically his guitar. Because it separates Jimi Hendrix from all the other guitarists who ever came before him and most of the ones that came after him. Well, I can't say all. There's obviously some exceptions. Is that he was always actually, a, it was always a duet. Like Sonny and Cher. Donnie and Marie Osmond. Except the other person in the duet was his guitar. And I think that they missed out because they never had described the relationships that Hendrix had with his guitar. It wasn't just a musical instrument, it was an actual personality. It's like the man was schizophrenic and the guitar was his other personality. And I think by missing that, they could have missed a really opportunity to make a really interesting film. It's not just, you know, and I think, it, you know, it's an important statement about art overall, is the relationship to what it is you're creating beyond just the technical aspects. You know, the goal, I think, of any artist is to actually find a voice within the stuff that you're doing. It goes beyond just the technique, beyond just what you are being able to depict, but why you're depicting it and what you're trying to say with your, your something I think most of us spend our entire careers trying to figure out. I know I certainly have not figured it out. So that's a lot of crap for you this evening. Since I can't see the chat comments, probably all making fun of me. Okay, so I like to rough it up. I think it'll give, it'll start more of an organic surface. It's not just that I'm doing random brush strokes on here, but I'm actually trying to shape it. And rather than, you know, I mean, obviously you can do a lot of shaping with the blue brush and other such things, but what I like about using the clay tube brush, and yes, this is a technique I definitely got from Tomas Fiddle's box. Um, it's been very helpful in the way that I sculpt now, is I can build up the surface and find the forms. That's the most important thing. Even this is a fairly simple surface. It's, you know, building in that sort of organic kind of quality to it early on, I think is really helpful. I might not leave all these brush strokes in there. I'll probably be covered with hairy detail and other things, but at least right now it doesn't look CG. It looks, uh, it looks like something that has grown.
Okay, I think I can see the chats, the chat remarks on YouTube, finally. Okay, let's get back to work then. Um, doesn't look like I missed much, so that's cool. So let's see what the joint looks like on the next segment. Verify. Yeah, see. Uh, oh, these guys are so mean. They're not nice at all. There we go. That's kind of nice. Oh yeah. See, we got really. I need to pump up that bend a little bit more. Hey Queens, how you doing, man? shape going. I mean, I'm in a slightly different angle than this guy, but that's, it's, I don't know, there's something about that shape that kind of cracks me up. It's so weirdly mechanical. It's almost got like a taper. Let's go down a few steps here and smooth. Got to get that, that weird bend in there. Oh, we know that's an important part of its shape, so I've got to respect that. This is the stuff, you know, it's like the more you can pay attention to these fine details, that's what makes the difference between just the sculpt of a random bug and something that's really kind of informative. There's a few artists that specialize in insect um, drawings and such that I really like. There's one, uh, I can never, let me look him up because it's worth knowing his name. Okay, this gentleman, Karim Nahobo Bu, I know I'm not pronouncing his name right, but he's an illustrator, so these are all his illustrations, which he does like, you know, ink, colored pencil, I think he does some, no, that's an illustration, I mean, they're just, this guy is just fantastic, his attention to detail is amazing, so I follow him on Instagram, and just always astounded at the kind of stuff he does really truly remarkable. I mean it's really nice to see somebody dedicate themselves to uh, this kind of work. Oh and he does jewelry too. Well there you go. So that's very cool. Um, amazing work. So check him out. But you know it's like there's a difference between somebody drawing a picture of Bug and somebody who like him who just pays such close attention to the detail that he manages to capture the personality of the, of the particular critter so well. And that's it's it's just like you know the difference. It's like trying to capture a likeness of a of a person like a celebrity or something like that. It's all the subtlety that makes all the difference, and that's what I'm always trying to get. But it's also just an exploration of these shapes. So see how much more interesting that is now than what I had a few moments ago? And it just meant, means, you know, taking a look at the reference to really, really think about it. I still don't always get things right, and I'm sure I'll get a few things wrong in this, in this version since this is the first time I've done this particular critter. But that's okay, because that's part of the learning process. Um, there's also another thing, and weirdly enough, I'm going to bring it back to Jimi Hendrix. Um, I was a huge uh, guitar nerd for a while. I don't play nearly as much anymore, but back in the day, and I was a huge Hendrix fan. And I always liked to figure out his songs by ear, you know, with the tape deck back in the day, or record player, Skipping Needle. We didn't have all the cool technology that we do now that makes it a lot easier. But I would always, you know, I had some of his stuff as notation or whatever, but I was like trying to figure it out by ear. It's a little bit harder, especially with a tape deck. You go through a lot of tapes. But I was said, you know, I was trying to get it as close to what I think I heard as I possibly could get. And with him it's a little bit tricky because of the way he plays and plays around a lot of the notes and stuff. 
But I was used to say, you know, if I get something wrong, it's not that big a deal because even if I get something wrong in learning one of his solos or whatever, I still will figure out something really cool. You know, I'm still going to get a really cool lick out of it. You know what I mean? It's something I can add to my little repertoire of guitar licks and pull out and make it my own. I think there was like one particular lick from Spanish Castle that once I figured it out, it spawned a thousand ideas for my own terrible guitar solos. Um, and it's the same thing with, with uh, when you're trying to do an insect, an organism, and you're trying to get it as right as possible. And I get really hung up. I really hate when I get things wrong, and I always try and make things right. But it's just a reality that's, especially if you're working off a photographic reference, it's, it's just not always easy to do. But at the very least, the more you try and get it correct, you'll always find cool ideas for your own creatures, even if you get something wrong. Still, you know, that little arc in the, in the leg that makes all the difference and suddenly gives this guy so much more personality. That's something that I, you know, if I'm going to do a creature design, I'm going to remember something like that, as opposed to just having a sausage, you know, like these things. So, um, and there's also sometimes these shapes that we see in the uh, legs here are, um, are actually useful. Like if you look at honeybee legs, they're like a switchblade, or not a switchblade, a switch army knife. The particular shapes have such a huge influence in how it's able to collect pollen and navigate through not only the environment, but through the nest and stuff. So a lot of those subtle shapes that we might not pay attention to as creature artists actually have an important not, I don't want to say purpose, but they have an important, and they're, they are an important adaptation that has allowed the insect to thrive. Uh, I am making camel spider. Not really a spider, it's an arachnid, but I've been working on it the last few sessions. But So right now I'm refining the legs, which look like uh, hot dog weenies. And... That's basically what I'm working on. Okay, so if you're ending up with Dynamesh artifacts, a couple things you can do. There's, it depends on how thin you're getting it. Sometimes if I get like a really thin and it breaks into little pieces, I might use the inflate brush and inflate and try and join them and re-Dynamesh at a higher resolution. Sometimes that'll work. Uh, sometimes you could also do that kind of with Sculptress, working with Sculptress and Dynamesh at the same time. Um, sometimes I just, delete those parts and move on <laughs> and say, you know, re rework it a little bit. But usually it's it's a result of, like you're saying, you're, you're doing something way too thin. And uh, I do this real quick. Okay, so let's say I'm going to get a little Dynamesh going. Let's do... I just picked a random resolution, 1824, which gives me 2.1 million. That's probably more than I need. Let's, let's get it down a little bit. Okay, 77,000. And then what I'll do is I'll turn on the old sculptress mode. You know, yeah. re-dynamesh, and you start to get things really thin. All right, re-dynamesh, and then you get this kind of thing where it's all broken up. So, um, it's not always easy to fix. You might be just going too thin, but you can always try and repair it. I'm using inflate with sculptress mode. Let's turn off sculptress mode. Oops, I don't have sculptress mode on. Inflate this and that. See, that's gonna be a disaster. So you might wanna undo a few steps and just go back very gently with the inflate brush, inflate and smooth and just, you know, do that kind of thing. Sometimes if it's, you know, way too thin, you can kind of build it back with the inflate brush, but sometimes it just turns into a disaster as well and you end up with this kind of thing. So best to kind of just go very gently and slowly um, and just do a back and forth with the smooth and inflate. That's the only advice I can give you on that that I can think of. It's, uh, Basically the trick. Okay, so now on to the next segment. Let's see how this fits in here. 
Let's see if we can glean. It looks like we have on this leg right here a little bit of a gap in there, probably, and there's a slight joint. So let's go in here and whoops. Control click on that. So we gotta move that over a little bit. It looks like there's a little bit of space there where it kind of you know, as it bends in. It needs that for something, so I'm gonna see if we can get that going there. And I'm gonna get the old play tunes going. I got my mask by let's just do this. Back to making the end of depression. And This really is kind of just a very straight, not terribly interesting part. Let's go down a couple subdivisions and uh, let's see if we can straighten. I think that one doesn't need to be quite as exaggerated. It's a little bit more boring. Push that in like this. Good news is that the other legs are pretty similar, so I can just sculpt one pair of the legs and just duplicate that. So that's what I usually do. You know, with some some insects such as the honeybee or different types of bees, the legs, you know, front legs, and middle legs, and rear legs are incredibly different. So you can't get away with that too much. But like ants and other and spiders. Sometimes the legs are similar enough that you can save some time by duplicating them. I did that, I did that on a crayfish that I modeled last week. Uh, let's go up in the subdivision. Let's do SK cloth. And then it's kind of typical. This is sort of a typical kind of ridge right here. Oops, in the old key. I keep forgetting I have the space mouse. It's right there. And there was this time I was going to Shelbyville and I tied an onion to my belt because that was the style at the time. We couldn't get uh, the fancy red onions because of the war and the Kaiser had taken our name for 20 and replaced it with diggity so we had to say diggity if we wanted to get 20 on we had to say diggity onions so anyways what I was saying is that I was tying an onion to my belt which was the style of the time back in those days believe it or not Nichols had pictures of bees on them we used to say to each other, we'd say, hey, give me five bees for a quarter. That's what we'd say. That's just a story of the old country. Back when we had the, the big kerfuffle with uh, Shelbyville, constantly, constantly in a rival situation with them. They were really into turnips for some reason. But they did have a very nice monorail at one point. Or was that North Haverbrook? I think that was North Haverbrook that had the monorail. We wanted to get a monorail. It was very expensive. I mean, we had just come into a bunch of money in the town, so we were trying to figure out what to do with it. We were thinking about getting those guitars that are like, you know, double guitars. Um, but this man came to town. I'd never seen him before, and he started telling us about how great it would be to have a monorail. And he had sold monorails to North Haverbrook. Put them on the map, actually. And so we thought this was a great idea. And he actually started a class at the local community college to, to find a conductor for the monorail. And I remember the first thing that we learned in class, it was actually the last thing we learned in class, is that mono means one and rail means rail. 
So there's one dude in the class who's a lot smarter. I mean, I've, I don't know if he'd actually done it before, done monorail conducting before, but he was clearly really on the ball. His name is Homer. And he ended up getting the job. And I remember that fateful day that they launched the monorail, and it was actually amazing because, believe it or not, Leonard Nimoy came for the maiden voyage in the monorail. And we were, you know, concerned because I thought there might have been a chance that the, uh, the track could bend. But they said, uh, no, it's not going to bend. It's a true story. Um, there was one woman in the town, and she was always, she's causing a lot of trouble. She's annoying the crap out of us. I think she was actually Homer's wife. But she got it all up in her head that she wanted to go and figure out if this dude was on the level, the guy who sold us the monorail. So he went, she went to North Haverbroken. The town was a ghost town. Apparently the monorail had destroyed the economy of the town. But we weren't that concerned. I didn't think it was going to happen to us. I mean, what are the chances that two towns are going to be destroyed, or three towns, their economy is going to be destroyed by installing the monorail. So we went ahead, and on that fateful day, the track did bend. The brakes gave out. There was a possum in the control room. His name was, her name was Bitey, rather. She's the big one. But luckily, our fearless conductor, Homer, managed to use a giant donut on the donut shop as like an anchor and managed to actually stop the monorail and save everybody's life and no one ever saw Leonard Nimoy again. True story. So, Looking a little bit better, looking a little bit more organic. Let me leave like a little gap right there. I, I can't tell, but it looks like there's a segment, some kind of a little bit there. Let's check it out. I can't tell from there. Yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting little detail, but I might save that for later if I can find some other reference to help figure that out. That might be the true It's not. Um, Kind of can't, only as good as your reference. Gonna have as much reference as possible. Because it's always those little things that'll keep you up at night. See, this is one of my own pictures where I spend an afternoon with one of these guys. But it's not really clear. I can see this a little bit better down here though. It never ends. Let's take a look at the ending here though. And we got this is kind of a typical shape for an insect leg. Look at that arc in there. Oops. Control click. Hold the Alt key. Move it over there. Hold the Alt key. Let's bring it in. These like very subtle S curves are very common in segmented animals. And a lot of it has to do, it's actually not just a pretty looking, it has to do with the fact that they're, um, believe it or not, well, I can't say for sure because it's an arachnid, but in insects, you have a pair of muscles, just like we have a pair of muscles in a bicep or whatever, right? Because all the muscles um, retract, right? They either relax or they pull in. Or do I have that backwards? Anyways, there's a pair of muscles in insect uh, legs that work very much like um, the muscles in our arms. It's just they're on the inside of the bone as opposed to the outside of the bone. So sometimes these shapes, you get these types of shapes. A lot of spiders are actually have more like fluid-based muscle systems. It's actually like hydrostatic pressure. I don't know for camel spiders. Um, so they're, they, they could be a bit different, but with insects you get this kind of bowed look because there's a joint 
there's an attachment in there and then there's muscles in the inside. So I don't know much about the interior anatomy of these guys. I haven't done them any the research. Right now, actually, I'm on kind of a bee thing right now. I'm all excited about bees. Not just honeybees, but solitary bees and orchid bees and uh, bumblebees and, and that kind of stuff. They're just amazing animals. Um, everybody knows about the honeybees. Well, most familiar with the honeybees. But there are many, many other species of bees to pay attention to. And they're not all social like honeybees are. And only a few make honey. Um, you talk about different honeybees. Honeybees, in a way, I mean, they're really feral or mostly domesticated animals. They're basically like chickens. They, we've been messing with them for so long, and, and this is not the judgment. It's just like any other livestock, cows, pigs, whatever. Um, but, you know, we have basically... Uh, used a lot of artificial selection in their evolution, not just natural selection. So when you see bunnies, uh, bunnies, when you see uh, honeybees in the wild, typically, at least in North America, they are feral in the woods. They're still an imported invasive species, technically, or livestock, really. But it doesn't mean that they don't make hives in the wild because some of them are feral. They split off and become hives. But not all honeybees, or not all bee species, are social. There's a lot of different variations in it. It's like a gradient. Completely solitary bees to bees that are live in very small colonies, or what would be almost described as like condos, the bee version of condos, um, to sort of proto nest, actual nests. So there's a wide range. Of course, not all bees stay. Not all entomologists are big fans of honeybees. I know some entomologists that really can't stand them. I like them though, because I find them fascinating. But they can actual honeybees. We have a weird thing where we associate them with nature. I mean, they're almost synonymous with nature in spite of the fact that they're really like livestock run amok. Um, that's kind of funny. But they can be a threat in terms of um, pushing out native species over out competing them. I mean, I've been in the desert taking pictures of bugs with the bug shot folks and You'll see a nice flowering bush of some sort, and native bees will be struggling to pollinate. And you can see them get kicked out by the uh, by the honeybees. The honeybees will come and push them out. And then people talk sort of a lot about you know the killer bees, for this kind of bee, that kind of bee. There's a lot of you know honeybees, just like dogs, have breeds. So there are they're not quite species. They really would be analogous to. A, a breed of cow or a breed of dog. And some of these so-called Africanized bees are still honeybees, but they've been, you know, they're adapted to be more aggressive. I saw some pretty cool bees nests one, one time. It was, a, it was a big, huge, massive, like the size of a small car. Pretty awesome. Okay, so see how we've gone from sausage something that's starting to look like a leg. And I love these spikes here. I'm going to do that spike as a separate element, though. I'm not going to build that in necessarily. Um, I like to do my legs 
as much as possible in segments when it makes sense to as separate pieces of geometry. They might be in the same subtool and separated by polygroups, or in some cases I might split them into subtools, but I always try and do them separately as opposed to just kind of drawing in divisions between the various segments because that usually yeah you could work in a pinch, but if you can animate it or something. You really want to have the segments more accurate than that. Let's see. I feel like we're missing a segment. A little footsie right down here. Uh, it's hard to say because we have a footsie there. Do we have a footsie on the other legs? Yeah, it's a little, it looks like there's a little division right there. Let's take a look at some of these other ones. Oh yeah, definitely have a little, a little foot. Oh, and this has a reflection so you can see a little bit better. It's just, wow, it's such a primitive little bell-shaped thing. You almost don't even see it, but there it is. This is when I do the poly painting. The the thing that I like to pay attention to that I find is interesting is the, how they, uh, the contrast of color, the light and dark parts. The change in contrast between light and dark is usually has a way of drawing your attention to it. I think it's a really cool detail. You usually have a light part on the joints and a dark point, or the reverse. Sometimes it's the exact opposite. Also depends on how old the critter is, because as these things age, they tend to darken in color. Okay, so we need a little segment for the foot. This guy right here, oh, isn't that adorable? Okay, so... In this case, what I'm going to do... I'm going to append the star. Uh, I do make some uh, of these to print. Um, I recently just printed up a trilobite. I have a little uh, Form 3 here in the studio. Um, and I've also done, um, I did a, nice, a, a big job a couple few years ago for uh, a museum in Australia. I've, I've no, never been to Australia, so I haven't seen it in person. But it was a really cool job because I had to model something like 30 bugs, various different bugs, really obscure stuff too. Um, and then this company called um, CDM Studio that's in Perth, Australia. They printed them up. They have a CNC router, so the prints are really beautiful. If you look on my uh, web page, um, there's some pictures. Typing in the URL for my, my web page. So if you're curious, there are some pictures on there, some of the bugs. In the prints. The prints came out beautifully. Unfortunately, they're on the other side of the world, so I've never actually seen them in person. But someday, if we ever get out of this stupid pandemic and I get enough money, I'm going to go to Australia and check that out because I think it would be nice to see the prints. Of course, I also have my own printer now and I have all the models, so I could just print them out and save myself a trip to Australia. But I think they did a really good job painting them. They came really pretty. I think their printer is superior to what I have, so it'd be nice to see their prints. And then I also have been working with ZBrush Jewelry Workshop, yay! And um, been making some of my own jewelry and teaching jewelers how to use ZBrush. And uh, it's a venture I started with Henry Williams. Uh, Tony Rodriguez and Tomas Fiddlesbach, who does his live stream on Mondays, by the way. If you haven't seen his live stream, it's a really good one. And um, so we've been, you know, that's what's gotten me really into printing, really excited about printing, is doing jewelry stuff. So I had a few of my pieces actually cast in silver and had them for sale and stuff. And they're all, all bug related, of course. Uh, but it's it's really fun. And I mean, I think 3D print is the thing that I'm most excited about right now because it's just amazing when you work on something for a really long time and you know every single stroke and every little part of it. And then to see it printed as a real object is just amazing. It's just astounding. And then I have my little spider. I made a jumping spider ring. 
and um, I had it with me on a trip recently. I was wearing it and I rotated it around so the spider is in the inside of my hand. And um, that way, whenever I got bored, I just opened up my hand and had a little friend there. It's so cute. I don't, I don't have much detail to go on in here, just the overall shape. So what I'm going to do now is let's do a mirror and weld. Just so we have two of them. There we go. Now what I'm going to do is I want to merge this with the other legs, right? With these guys. These are separate up to Let's clear the mask on that, right? So what I'm going to do is, where is that? Is that the top one? It's this one right here. So let's rename it. I'll call it Penny Pelts. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my little footsies here and move them up. So just below the petty palps. And what I want to do is I want to merge down, right? Problem is, is if I merge down, I'm going to lose my subdivision levels, right? So I've got, what, six subdivision levels on this piece, and I like to keep them. But I don't have any on this piece. So what I need to do is first save the model. Always save when you do this, because you're in the risk of having something that is not saved, so we'll put six. And we'll take a sip of beer. So I want to merge down. I want to keep the subdivision levels. So I'm going to divide this so it has the same number of subdivision levels as the Petty Pops, which is six. So now this little footsie has the same number of subdivisions as the Petty Pops. So I should be able to select this and do a merge down. So merge down. It's not undoable. Not the end of the world. It does work. I always do reconstruct subdivision rules, but I'm just kind of demonstrating that. So did it work? Yes. So now I have six levels of subdivision, and these guys are all in the same subtool. Let's make sure. I believe they're different color groups. So it should work well. So now I can go in here, and uh, I'm going to take my H polish brush. There we go, that one. A little clean up here. Just to kind of define these forms a little bit better. So on the clear tube, Z intensity is like three. So let's go to that. It's gonna make a nice ring. I need a, a set of uh, rings that are actually a wedding ring based on my emblipage on my tailless whoop scorpion. Uh, so there's this amazing scientist named Piggy Wolven, and she is biologist but also a fabulous person and she keeps tailless whip scorpions as pets and so they molt every once in a while when they molt she takes the exoskeletons and pins them and frames them I have, a, I have one that was done by uh, Jill Wisen on my wall it's a really cool looking bug but she's really into these things, but her husband is an astronomer. So they wanted me to design a ring for them that was based on the tailless whip scorpion in the front. And on the back had the four Galilean moons of Jupiter. So this is a ring, so they're going to be really, really small. So I had to figure out a way to kind of capture the personality of each of the Galilean moons with as few details as possible. And it came out pretty well. So we printed that we cast them. We printed them up and we actually cast them in white gold. And she was really happy with them. They were both really happy with them. I think they were really cool. They're on my website. Um, if you're curious, it's really a cool ring. I remember one of my favorite ring designs.
How did I start with the idea of doing bugs in ZBrush? Well, I'll tell you what. Um, it was a gradual process that led to a revelation. So I had started doing... Um, I started doing CG back in 1999. My first job was working at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, which is a real place. It was actually one of the biggest biological medical philanthropies in the world until the Bill Gates Foundation came along. But it's still second. It's a huge organization, a great organization, but they have all these Nobel Prize winning scientists, and they just fund research, right, biomedical research. So um, my first jobs were doing animations that were largely explaining their research and so these guys be like cancer researchers and uh, viruses and immune immunity and all that kind of stuff so i did a lot of cell biology um, animations and then when i moved to hollywood i was going to noman taking classes at noman and also doing um, entertainment stuff on the side well, entertainment stuff was my main job and then also still doing science animations and i was doing a job for the boston museum of science it was this really goofy movie that we did it was a really nightmare of a job um but i had there's all these segments where i had to animate um like uh, ticks and other critters that live on your skin right so as a side note i was always interested in robotics not so much from a technical aspect because i'm not a very technical person and at least I, you know i'm not very handy i don't build things very well um but I liked the aesthetics of robots a lot. But I also really like cell biology, and I really love biology. And so I was working on this job, and I realized, you know, and of course the thing that I love most in the world is doing CG, making stuff, right? Um, so it don't, I had a brilliant flash of the obvious, which was that insects actually combined all the things that I loved doing working on turns because i was really frustrated at the time trying to figure out what to do with my art you know this is the what 2005 2006 so sort of era of the first avatar and that was what everybody was into that kind of design and i was into it too but I, and it didn't really feel like me you know what i mean like doing spaceships and hot chicks and stuff is okay and the, the robot thing had been kind of played out but i, I was kind of searching for something that I could sort of stake a claim on and, and really make my own. And so I had this revelation that um, insects and arachnids were the perfect combination of all the things I love. The science aspect, cell biology aspect, because they're made of cells, right? They are kind of like nature's robots, right? Also, I do love animation, and I, I like rigging okay, but I hate painting skin weights. Like, I really despise painting skin weights. I don't know why, it's just something I have no tolerance for and I kind of get bored making rigs for like people and that kind of stuff but bugs are great since they're segmented you can do a rig of a bug you don't really have to paint skin weights right because you can just weight the entire segment to a joint and then that works it works for me anyways for the most part with a few exceptions and uh, so I realized that I could do my animations I could do my ZBrush sculpting I could make really organic stuff but I also get that kind of robotic kind of quality out of it and it's also there just weren't that many people doing it like there isn't hardly anybody that focused all of their efforts there were plenty of people that did great bugs and spiders there's no doubt about that plenty of great creature designers out there um i could think of the spider at the end of the lord of the rings i guess that's in the return of the king i mean that is a fucking amazing sorry that is a really super duper model um in spite of the fact that it's completely inaccurate, it's still a beautiful model, but, you know, it's not really a spider. It's Shilo, which is kind of a demon. But anyhow, but there weren't that many people who said, I'm going to spend all my time doing arachnids and creatures and really getting into it and really trying to do realistic ones. So I said, that's something that I can kind of stake a claim on. Because unlike, you know, character artists and that kind of stuff, which there are a gajillion character artists out there, and even creature artists, there's plenty of people who can do an amazing lion and awesome horses and other stuff, and dinosaurs, of course. But insects are underrepresented, or at least were back then. So that is why I said, this is the thing I'm going to do. So one of the first cool bugs that I got to do, and aren't you sorry you asked, by the way? Because um, I'm just going to go, I got. I can go on like this for another hour. Um, 
One of the first bugs that I really did is I, I was really getting into the work of E.O. Wilson, who is still a huge inspiration. He passed away last year. He is, uh, if you don't know, he is the most famous ant scientist and one of the most famous scientists in the world. They, they consider him to be the modern day Darwin because that's how important his research is. And I got to do a job for him, this biology textbook that was supported by Apple. So this is a lot of, this is like 2010. And so, I, you know, my friend Gail, who I'd done a lot of work for, called me up and basically said, we have this job, we're gonna be doing this really exciting biology textbook for the Apple iPad, and E.O. Wilson's gonna write it. And I was like, that's cool, who's E.O. Wilson? And he said, well, he's one of the most famous ant scientists in the world, a biologist, you should know who he is. And so that night we were watching Jeopardy, as my wife and I occasionally do, and one of the answers on Jeopardy was E.O. Wilson. And I was just like, this, this guy is an answer to a Jeopardy question. He must be an important scientist. So I started reading his books. And ever since then, I've been obsessed with his writing. I think he's the most important science writer out there. I know most people think of Carl Sagan but, or Neil deGrasse Tyson. But if you want to go next level... If you really want to get serious about understanding science and read from a really great science writer, E.O. Wilson's the man. And there are a lot of people like me who are huge fans of Ed Wilson. If you, uh, if you read his books, you'll understand. So we had to do a pitch for the job because we're competing. Apple was sponsoring the job. Apple really wanted to do a textbook, a biology textbook for the iPad. This is back when Steve Jobs was still around. And it was Steve Jobs' pet idea. He was like, I really want to do a biology textbook. I want to make the iPad the new textbook of the modern classroom. Well, obviously that didn't happen. But at the time, that's what he was most excited about. And so we had to compete with some very high-level textbook publishers, Houghton Mifflin and people like that. We were just a small company. It just it was really a small company of like you know, 10, 15 people. And so my friend Gail hired me. He said, we need to do a demo. And so I did a model, a really good model. I'm still proud of it, of a Fidoli, which is one of the species. It's actually an entire genus of ant that Ed Wilson has defined, a very important one, known for their giant heads. And um, so I did this model. I remember working. It was on the 4th of July, actually, I think 2000. 11 or something like that. I'm still living in an apartment in West Hollywood. So I tied an onion to my belt, which was the style of the time, and um, made my way to Shelbyville. No, I made this this ant, and I was really proud of it. Rendered it mental ray. Took forever to render. And it did a cute little animation where it was like, you know, moving around and bumped into the virtual camera and knocked over the camera. It's just kind of a joke. But it was kind of a nice animation, and Gail liked it. And Gail actually took it into a meeting uh, at Apple and showed it to, to Steve Jobs. So that's the most firm, famous person I've ever showed my artwork to. But of course, I was not in the meeting personally. But it was really cool. And it actually it managed getting us the, the job. So we, got, we beat out the other publishers. Ed Wilson was the lead author. We worked with people like Drew Barry, who's a very famous molecular animator who's won a MacArthur Genius Award and other great people and I really got excited. It was such a fun job. It was like two years and I had to animate so much biology um, and a lot of critters too. Most of my models now I, I don't they, I've revised because they're okay for the time but now they're not quite up to my standards. Um, it was a really fun job ever since then I've just been you know and then I started going on yeah, I wanted to get reference better at reference, and the internet is only so good. So, a friend of mine turned me on to this group called Bugshot, a bunch of entomologists and photographers that go out into the field, and they hand workshops where they teach you how to take pictures of bugs, and they do seminars and lectures on entomology. It's really a lot of fun. Of course, because of COVID, I haven't been able to go. They, they had just one recently, I think, in Ecuador. But I went on a bunch of those, and I met a lot of bug scientists, and they've become really good friends of mine. And I've done the bug shot in Mozambique. That was the most fun. So 
Does that answer your question? Um, so back in those days, nickels had pictures of bees on them. So we'd go up to each other if we needed some change, and we'd say, hey, give me five bees for a quarter. So I tied an onion in my belt. Um, so going to Mozambique was really life-changing. Um, there's a park there called Golongosa Park, and it's the most amazing place in the world. You should read about it if the news is getting you down. Because let's face it, the news has not been fun lately. Um, I think that's too wide, but that's why we have submission on this. It is an astounding park, and why I am so inspired by it, you know, there's obviously there's a connection with E.O. Wilson there because he helped revitalize the park. It was one of his major projects towards the end of his life. Um, but it's a place where that proves that we can help nature recover because it's, you know, Mozambique had a terrible civil war for many decades, and many of the animals were killed in the park and poached. There's elephants wandering around that still have bullet holes in their ears and they're not they're not big fans of human beings but they managed to spend all this money revitalizing the park and working with the local economy making sure that the people who work in the park are from the local economy and they started a coffee company again with the locals and really just focusing on revitalizing the local economy as a way to support the park because if people have jobs and they're making money and they can feed their family they don't have an incentive to poach and you can also turn a lot of folks into park rangers. So they have a lot of locals as park rangers. And it's just the coolest place on earth because it shows you that it is possible to fix the damage that human beings have done if enough time and effort is put into it. How long it'll last, who knows? You know, Africa is not known for a whole lot of political stability. And they still have, the last time we went, or the only time we went, we were hoping to go visit um, the actual mountain, Mount Gorongosa there, but there were like rebels in there. It was just too dangerous, so we weren't able to go to the mountain because there's still some fighting in the Civil War. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen in Africa, given they get a lot of the grain from Ukraine. But I'm not going to talk politics. This is a family show. It's all about horrifying bugs. So, yeah, I know I'm kind of like zoning in on, uh, yeah, I use deformers all the time, um, but I like, I like the sculptural porch, uh, the best. I like to find the forms using the clay tubes brush. Um, oh yeah, I've been to Ecuador once. What a, what a great freaking country. What a beautiful country. I got to go to the Galapagos a few years ago and I'm just dying to go back. I really want to go back because... I just really loved it. Um, we went to the Galapagos and then we did a little bit of a, I mean, my wife and I did like a little cruise along uh, one of the rivers there. I, I forget which river. Um, it was really cool. But yeah, a lot of my bug nerd friends are there now having a great old time taking pictures of bugs while I'm in LA. Um, yeah, I mean, I love deformers. I, you know, another thing that I really love, a uh, new feature, might as well show it off since we're talking technical stuff. Let me say this real quick before I start screwing with my model. Is I love the um, the focal shift on the uh, on the gizmo now. That's one of my favorite features, and I'll show you what I mean. So I'm gonna save that and let's go to bring back the gizmo, and um, I'm going to press O for focal shift and set my focal shift to like this right here. Let's turn off and ask by polygroups. But this is like one of my favorite deformers, right? Just using the gizmo because you can pull this out. And if I wanted to create like a really smooth bend in there, it's just great. It's just a really handy, fun deformer to use. But I also use the other deformers all the time. But right now, since I'm sort of talking and sculpting, I'm kind of just like doodling because that's my... I mean, I spent way too much time in the foot there because I got lost in thought. But... What, this is such a cool thing because you can also, you know, move this way off here and, you know, get completely different effects depending on where you position the gizmo. Does that work with mass by polygraphs? I'm not sure. No. Anyways, 
So, yeah, but I also like the Ben Deformer a lot. And modest I mean, I also, you know, I'm a Maya artist, whether I like it or not. Um, so I use a lot of Deformers in Maya. But it's like right when I get, you know, when I'm at this stage, like I say, I like the clay brushes. It's a way to find the forms. Okay, so, I, you know, I might leave that where it is right now. I don't like to do... I'm not going to try and get this completely finished. You can see how I kind of bring things up to a certain level and then I stop and I move on to the next part because otherwise it gets hard to, you know, I, I kind of want to get a consistency of the entire thing and then come back and make corrections. So here's an example of where I'm going to, let's take a look at the legs here. Let's take a look, look at the tape. Legs for the most part, different proportions, but Similar anatomy and similar shape language. They got the freaky foots right here. Check out those feet, right? Woo! Nice. So I think what I can do is it's hard to say sometimes these pictures and like, poor guys are missing a limb. But I think I can model like one of the middle legs and then just duplicate that. So that's what I'm gonna do. Nice camouflage, man. This is one of this is actually one of my pictures that I took when on that trip uh, in Africa. They set up these white boxes and we uh, nerd out. But this thing was running right at me the entire time. It was just not happy. It did not like me at all. Hard to see the feet in this. So we have to do a little guesswork. But we can model one of these legs and then duplicate it. So I'm comfortable doing that. So one of the middle legs. There and then let's do this one. I'm do this and I'll do split hidden and then I'm trying to let's see, these are already dynamesh. Okay, so now what I want to do is separate these into segments. Let's close holes. Do a little smoothing. Knife brush. Everyone loves a knife brush. Make sure I didn't chop anything off. I don't want to chop off. You have to love the knife brush. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this, break this into poly groups based on the leg segments, and then I'll read down the mesh with the keep groups function on, and then I'll just break it into segments for me. So let's do Control W to make everything one polygroup. And then we could use a slice brush for this. Slice curve, right? We got one segment. We'll call it this one. And then another segment. Let's do this. And then we got one, two, this looks like the femur right here, so maybe I need to make that a little bit longer. I'll probably chop that in too. It's just from the parallax, I mean not the parallax, but the, the view there. We're not seeing the full length of it. It should look like this. Okay, so we'll do this. Alright. This. This. All right, that'll be good enough. Good enough for a start. We can always add another one in there from this one. Um, I'll turn on groups and redynamesh. And now we're gonna smooth. And look, there's closed segments now. So there's a little separation there. And there we go. All right. Uh huh. But. Symmetrical, so we'll do my topology, mirror and weld, there we go. And now they're symmetrical. And now let's do a Z remesh. Probably could have duplicated the petty palps as well, but whatever, you know. 
that prescription of key groups. Take a sip of beer. Um, as far as the hair, I haven't decided yet. I use a number of ways to do hair. So sometimes, you know, if I'm going to bring this into Maya and rig it and animate it, then I'd probably do something like Yeti or sometimes. This guy, the hair is very uniform and there's not much going on color wise compared to like a V. So I could get away with even doing paint effects and buying. But since this is a ZBrush demo, I think when I get to the hair, I will actually do a fiber mesh because I like to also, I also render in Keyshot and I can send the fiber mesh over in Keyshot. So I probably will for the, since I'm doing this particular model, especially for the live stream, I'll do uh, fiber mesh. And then sometimes with these big spikities that, you know, were very specifically placed, I'll do that with regular geometry. Like a lot of times you'll see spurs, can't see it here, but you know, in some of the segments, you know, if I encounter that and the bigger spurs, I'll do it with just model geometry. But, um, I'll burn that bridge when I get to it. So now let's take a look. And turn on our mask by polygroups and we get ourselves a move brush. And then we'll start to do a new thing. I'm going to flush out the cocoa here. I'm going to have to get some better reference, but let's just get this started. I think I'll have to do another segment, kind of look at it with the petty pumps. But let's just start with this segment here. You can see I'm leaving this mess for later on because that's going to be a whole other thing. Like to do or what I'm trying to do is I keep getting an Unreal 5 and then I get busy with some job that requires me to work in Maya or something like that. So I have to keep going back, learning Unreal again, and learning it again, and learning it again. But it's such cool software. You know, I'll, I'll get like a weekend here and there where I can spend a few hours playing in Unreal and then I'll get sucked into something and then. You know, a few weeks will go by, and then I'll get into this more free time, and go back into Unreal, and then have to relearn everything again. Um, but I really like Unreal 5. The interface is so cool. It's, it's, it feels much more like a 3D program, and you get the... Megascan's bridge is now part of Unreal, which is Unreal, because it basically means that you can drag and drop assets from Megascans directly into your scene. It's just wild. I mean, that right there is the holodeck. That's that's basically what the holodeck was all about. Constructing an environment, a custom environment, quickly and easily. And just remember that if you want to make things exciting, specify that you want the holodeck to be clever enough to beat Sherlock Holmes, not clever enough to beat Data. Because then the holodeck's gonna create a sentient being it's going to take over the ship. Bad things are going to happen. That's Moriarty for you. Can't trust that guy. He had a real grudge. Even the simulated Moriarty. Real grudge against uh, Picard. My wife can't stand that episode. My wife basically thinks that they should have gotten rid of the holodeck and data and the transporter and then space travel would have been much easier space exploration because half the problems on the damn ship come from one of those three things transporter holodeck or data worst of course is when you start combining them i'm kind of like if i was on the enterprise and i'm talking about next generation enterprise here if i ordered like a hot chocolate and it came out cold i would immediately abandon ship because every time there's something wrong with the 
Replicator, they're always like shrugging like, ah, Re Replicator, what are you gonna do? Next thing you know, everyone's turning into space monkeys. It happens like every freaking time. Anytime something goes wrong, just get an escape pod, get the hell out of there. Don't take the transporter, that's for damn sure. I love how everyone's like, the transporter is perfectly safe. Uh, except for that one time. Uh, and then there was that other time. Um, I have made many IMM brushes, and I use them sometimes for hair. Um, I haven't really, I've done some bug parts, but the thing is, is that I'm very particular in getting, you know, I don't, if you're trying to do a realistic, accurate bug, it's not really a kit bash situation, but it could be useful. You know, I kind of, you know, what I'll do is I'll take a, an existing bug sometimes and adapt it for, um, if they're similar enough, like a spider or something like that. But yeah, I do, uh, I do IMM brushes all the time. I'm a big fan of, uh, multi-alpha brushes too. So let me get the other questions here. How do you just... Um... Yeah, uh, back face settings. It's not a rookie question. It's an excellent question. It's something I forget to uh, turn on. So some of these brushes, this is uh, one of Tomas Vittelsbach's brushes. It's actually uh, his clay tubes brush. Uh, it has back face mask on by default. Back face mask is also another one that's, it's kind of good to put down here. In fact, let's do that because there is um, a downside to using the back face mask brush. I'll show you what I mean in a second. So I'm going to go in here, custom, oh, whoops, sorry, config, uh, enable customize, brush, back face mask, control alt, let's drag it down here somewhere, that's fine. And then, I was actually just using this as a demo, so we can put this over here, let's do that, there we go. And then we can do uh, preferences, enable customize, store config, okay, so that way, I can add back this mask down here. So, um, if I subdivide this, let's see if I can get it to work. Of course, it's a demo, so it will never work. But if I use this clay tubes brush and it has back face mask on, it's really good for the thin parts because all the clay brushes have that problem where they affect the other side. But sometimes as you're sculpting, and I was just encountering this problem a second ago, I was just too lazy to fix it. Um, you can get a point where on these thin parts where you start to get these weird little artifacts because of the back face masking. And of course, I can't get it to do it now. Um, but so sometimes you might want to turn off back face masking if you're getting like these weird little crispy bits. I I have some up here. No, I don't. Um, sometimes it can help eliminate those kinds of artifacts. But most, you know, for a lot of the clay brushes, I use back face masking. And then I'm using mask by auto groups, which is allowing me to do things like easily tug this part over the other part, say also other groups on. I would say in my opinion, you know, I just taught a class recently, an online class, um, people of various skill levels. Um, mastering polygroups, man. Master polygroups and masks, that's half the battle with ZBrush. Um, because the more you use, you can use polygroups for just about anything, and they're really, really useful. This is just one example. And then masking, of course, also. So it's like, it's... I mean, I've been using ZBrush since 2004, so a lot of this stuff is second nature to me, but it's still really, really important. And then there's some stuff I still, you know, I'm also an old guy, so... I'm not always up on the latest tools, because, you know, old guys who tend to get habits. Old them, I guess I should say. I'm an old day. And then let's do this. Let's see the questions. Uh, that is Eric. Hey, how you doing, Lena? What's going on? Long time no no see. Uh. Yes, I do watch the Orville, and it is good. The Orville, 
is um, is really is like you know it's funny because you watch the first few episodes eh, it's okay got Seth MacFarlane doing his thing and then around episode five of season one they're like fuck it guys let's just do the next generation let's just pick up where they left off and just do the next generation and they do it brilliantly it's really really good and uh, I've worked with a few I know a few people who work on that show Brandon Fiat I worked with him at Bad Robot uh, it's a visual effects supervisor I worked with some of the other people. Gary Tang, um, I can't remember if he was in the class at Noman or what, but I know him, I know him from Instagram, he works in that show, he was a great show, G Young did some creature design, and he was a fuse effects for that show, so it is, uh, yeah, I, I second that, I recommend the Orville, it's goofy, the thing I really like about the Orville is their interpersonal relationships between the characters, as silly as they are, they're less cringy than the next generation. There's sometimes when they try to do emotional stuff between the characters in the next generation, it got a little cringy. And you started to see the limits of the acting ability of the people other than Patrick Stewart. <laughs> so, I like it. I think it's a good show. I'm a fan. Yeah, I'm doing all right, still in LA. Where are you at, Lena? Are you in New Zealand still? All right, I'm starting to make stuff up here. I'm gonna check my reference, but oh, let's just leave that there and just shape these things and I'll fix the problems in a second. I don't know if this bump is supposed to be there. I got a little carried away there. This this part, I think I think I've made this one this shape. Well, I don't know. It's hard to say. Okay, this is the femur, right? Femur, femur, femur. Let's make sure that we got the right part. Yeah, I think, yeah, you're right. The first three, the first three episodes of Orville. The new season is really nice, though. They had some good stuff going on in there. Um, but, yeah, I think there was, because I had a friend of mine, because I, actually I wasn't much of a Seth Marlick, McFarlane fan. At least I wasn't. Um, now I'm starting to like him, that I kind of understand where he's coming from a bit more. He's just a, he's just a nerd, and he, he enjoys it. And... Um, but I had a friend convince me to stick it out, and um, you know, by I think the seventh episode, I was like, "Yeah, this is good stuff. Fun to watch." And they really do that kind of nice. They make some interesting allegories, um, which is what Star Trek was always great great at. Which I hear I haven't really watched uh, Strange New Worlds, but I hear Strange New Worlds is good. I was not a fan of Picard. Or. Yeah, I like some of the discovery, but I, I don't like it when they when they start getting into the mirror universe, the alternate universe, where everybody has goatees, I get kind of bored because I'm like, if we're in an alternate universe, then who cares what happens? It's the Rick and Morty thing. It's like, if there are an infinite number of alternate universes and you manage to find your way into one that's better, why would you go back to the one that's worse? What the hell's the difference? It doesn't make any difference. So whenever they do the mirror, mirror stuff in Star Trek, I'm kind of like, well... I don't really care. Um, I could just kill their duplicate in that universe and hang out there and have a good time. One show that I thought made a really good case for why we should care about alternate timelines was uh, was Loki. I thought that was a good one. Um, it kind of made more sense what was going on. Had a better excuse for giving a crap about alternate timelines than a lot of shows. But like, that's just like my opinion, man. Okay, kind of putzing around a little bit too much. Okay. Uh, I'm still uh, working at Weta, Lena. 
I know I've seen some of your stuff every once in a while I run across it. It's very cool. This looks like a pretty simple opening down here. So this is the, uh, so this would be the femur. This is the tibia. This is the coxa. I think there's another segment that I gotta add in here somewhere. So this might be the trochanter. We'll see. But I'm not gonna worry about that just yet. Just wanna get these into a decent spot, and then I'll take a look at the reference again. I think the proportions might be a little bit off. I mean, it depends. They're different for each of the pairs of legs. Do the control and shift and get the clay tubes and then it puts the lotion in the basket and it makes a little depression and So as I was saying earlier, I tied an onion to my belt because that was the style at the time. When I was going to elementary school, it was a very strict elementary school. I had a lot of rules. Everything was a paddling. I'll come back to the teacher. That was a paddling. Looking out the window, that was a paddling. Paddling the canoe. Because that might have been the time that the local townsfolk took over the schools because the teachers went on strike. sausage legs. Sausage legs, that's a great nickname. Well, that's the point I'm hoping to inspire you. <laughs> yeah, mash, bifrost, and blind shapes. I hear you, man. I, uh, you know, I've been using Maya for a long, long, long time, and it's fine. But I like the days when I get the ZBrush days are always more fun. I like ZBrush days. When I get a job, they tell me to sculpt all day long. That's super fun. Luckily, I have a couple of those going on right now. I don't mind working in Maya, but it's not as much fun as ZBrush. Okay. we got to take out the reference here because I'm getting, getting ahead of myself here. This is supposed to be the Tarsus, which is, looks like just a thin, super thin piece. Mm, that's my be better reference. Let's see. I'm, I'm way off, but that's okay. It's, it's, it's better than it was. 
I think I need to get some of this kind of flare, like he's got bell bottoms on each of these segments. So I gotta bring that out a little bit more. Here it's okay. I might have exaggerated that a little bit too much. Yeah, I spent a lot of time trying to get these shapes right. Because then my favorite part is detailing. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. I don't want to detail on something that's wrong. I had a friend who's a scientist that I used to work with, Satoshi Amagai. And he would just say, wrong is wrong. That's what he'd say. If it's wrong, you gotta fix it. So that's why I spent a lot of time trying to get these shapes right. Based on these various different reference images before I get to detailing. And detailing is when I go hog wild, you know. Even on something like this that doesn't seem to have a whole lot of detail, comparatively speaking, compared to like in Black Bidget, they have a lot more detail. I still want to get the shapes right first. So I'm fussing over this, so let's do this. Let's go down. I think they hide the sand. I guess technically that's pretty subtle. And they are camouflaged. That's pretty subtle. Okay, so there's a few things that they do that's subtle. But. Now we're gonna smooth this out. Just jam it in there. Real good. Maybe a little bit of a curve. Uh, do I have any advice on using sculpting layers or how to manage more global changes so there are version variations review? Well, I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of the sculpting layers in ZBrush. I know some people are, and that's just a different style of working. I always kind of just forget when I'm using them. That's what drives me crazy. When I create variations, it's, you know, the simplest thing is obviously just create different versions of the scene but another thing i'll do is i'll just duplicate sub tools and then put, put together folders and each folder might have a variation in it so i'll do that sometimes um the nice thing and i just ran into this last week i was kind of i was working on a, a job for a client and uh they're going back and forth with variations and then they uh, it was actually a character, so I'm not going to go into more detail than that, but it was kind of like, you know, we, you know, can, the character needs to look younger, so we need the character look younger. But, you know, so I'm spent some time making the character look younger, and then I get a note. Oh, but, you know, we like the old cheekbones, to so bring back the old cheekbones. So in that case, I just went, just the old project history, man. Well, not old, because it's fairly new relatively speaking. So the project history though is like really nice to be able to, uh, to just dial in, you know, use a history brush just to dial in the older cheap bones on the newer model, newer version. So that was kind of fun. So of course that depends on the fact that I was still working on the same project and I had saved the history. So that's, you gotta do that. But, you know, one thing that you could do is you can always, you know, if you like using sculpting layers, sculpting layers are a great way to go. Me personally, not a fan. Um, but another thing you do is if you have variations that are sub tools or other versions, then, you know, you can always use projection as a way to combine details from different versions, whether it's history projection or sub tool projection, history projection, I guess is more accurate. I found them to be somewhat similar, but, you know. I mean, the nice thing about sculpting layers is if you have one of those annoying clients that says, can we have, you know, 60% of version 2 with 20% of version 4 and 10% of version 8 or whatever, you could literally dial that in with, uh, with sculpting layers. But generally speaking, when a client starts talking like that, it's because they don't know what the hell they're talking about. 
Um, that's just me being grumpy. You knew that. You guys know what I'm saying, right? The best is when you have a committee of people that you have to please. Oh, there's nothing more fun than that. Especially when they when they give you notes and it's just an email thread, and it's just them talking to each other, and you're like, guys, and you miss like an email or you miss a note. I had another job. I'm not complaining or anything here. I had another job where uh, I was in the middle of a meeting and they were like complaining that my model didn't look like their reference. So I'm like, can you pull up the reference? I'm like pulling up my reference. I'm like, oh, it's just like the reference as far as I can tell. This is not an insect job. It's something much more boring and horrible. Um, and they were like, no, no, that's, that's not looking like it at all. Look at this reference. And I'm looking at the reference. I'm like, I have never seen that reference before in my life. Nobody sent me that reference. You guys have been talking about the reference for the past week. Nobody sent it to me. That's always a joy. I have another pet peeve. It's like when I'm working with a client, and they say CGI instead of CG. For some reason, that bugs the hell out of me. Like CGI. You don't have to say CGI. Just say CG. My wife doesn't get why I make the distinction, but it bugs the hell out of me. CGI is such a 90s thing to say, I guess. Maybe that's why it bothers me. Did you see that Jurassic Park? Those dinosaurs were made with CGI. It's true, you know. Computers just generated them. You hit some buttons, there you go. You got a dinosaur. And there's a movie. Put some kids in there, electric fence. You got yourself a franchise. I'm hoping that they do a Jurassic Park movie where the dinosaurs get together and open a restaurant the drive through I like to hear about all the drama the restaurants Tyrannosaurus Rex trying to fill the to-go bags with those tiny arms I mean that's that's entertainment personally I would make a movie about park park trilobite park <laughs> the entire park is just overrun with just thousands of different types of trilobites just crawling around that's the whole movie just kind of Kind of tickling your feet there. Those things will tickle, tickle the hell out of you. you the ticklers, French ticklers, trilobite ticklers. Little kids with the electric fence trying to get the ice cream. Trilobites. Trilobites are ridiculous. There's no way those things are real. Um. All right, I haven't gotten very far. I've only got 20 minutes left. Oh, well, this is an ongoing saga of me rambling while I try to make this thing. So i got to get serious with the legs here. Got to get serious, because look, right here, it looks like we have it. Yeah, see, this is kind of a typical. All right, now we got some good air. I don't know if you can see this on your screen. I'll see if we can make it bigger, but it looks like... Uh, okay, so this is these are the types of spikes. I make these spikes with geometry, just cones, and then the smaller hairs with hair. But it looks like we got okay. We got the coaxa. We got the chicanter. Got the femur. Got the tibia. Got the looks like I could be wrong about this. But anyways, the important thing is the tarsus and the metatarsus. It looks like we have a foot here and two small segments and larger segment. And then out of this is we got a couple of spikes. So what we can do about this is I'm going to go down here. You know, I got the basic shape. I don't really care about the detail on the higher level. So I'm going to delete higher levels as subdivision because I just don't care. It's kind of close enough to the shape that I want. And this. this. I don't even do it. This even mesh. Who knows? I mean, anything can happen at this point. And then, da da da, da 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 da. Make a metatarsus right there. And this is almost like an insect leg right here, if I'm correct. But that definitely looks like it's got several small segments there. And he's making up as he goes along. Um, 
That's a line on primitive. Mm -hmm. Polysphere there. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to do zero in Zoink, do that. Got my faves down here. Let's move that sucker. I do have some really nice books on arachnids, and I haven't even looked looked up this guy to see if there's some better diagrams or something. So I'm gonna do that. All right, something like that. Maybe a bit smaller. Oops. Move it and that myself a duplicate. So long, short, short foot. So this is going to be the foot. This. This is sort of a typical insect foot that I'm doing here, but it'll work for now. Yeah, I, luckily, I haven't done live production meetings. I mean, I, you know, I've worked in studios, obviously, where you, you know, art director would ever show up. But that's not the same. I haven't done a, a live. That sounds like a nightmare. I don't think I could take it because I think I would, I'd start turning into a, an incredible asshole in the middle of the session and get fired. Um, I'm not actually known for my patience. Um, no, that's not true. Uh, but yeah, I don't think I would do very well with that. Luckily, most of the time I have meetings and then I go off and do my thing. Also, I work with a lot of people that I've worked with many times over the years. That's usually the best way to avoid the pain. Doesn't always happen, of course. But whenever I get to work, uh, there's a group of artists that I work with on a fair number of projects. I just finished up a project with them recently. I cannot talk about it in any kind of specificity. It's the same group of artists that I worked with. It's a company called Filmograph, and it's run by my friend, my friends Aaron Becker and Seth Kleinberg, Troy Miller, and they're just awesome people to work with. And I always work with some really good designers and really good art directors, and it's just so much fun. And we put together so many really cool things. We did. Uh, I cannot vouch for the movie, but I will tell you I enjoyed the end titles, which is Aquaman. So we didn't do the Aqu Aquaman end titles, and that was a lot of fun. So that was a nice group of people to work with, and we all kind of trust each other and know each other and know and so we can give each other crap and, and go out and have a few beers and whatever. But it's nice when you can work, whenever you can work with people that you know and trust. That's always that's always the best. Because even if you do get into a meeting where things are getting a little haywire and nobody knows what they're doing, it can at least be a little bit fun. Okay, so real simple. But what I'm going to do now is, since I have like kind of a wide variety of topologies here, I'm going to do another Z remesh um, just to kind of even things out a little bit. I'll go back to making more detail. But you know, it's, my goal right now is just to get the basic forms and get away from that stupid sausage look. So zero mesh should keep groups. I'm going to set this to well, this is eleven thousand. We can do half. Let's set this to half. Let's see what happens. Mm, that's pretty low. I don't feel that I like that. So I'm going to do that. Turn off half. Let's do adaptive. I'm going to do twenty-five thousand. That's all. I want something that's a little bit more consistent. It's still not perfect. 
Yeah, I can always go in here with the uh, Z modeler and delete some edges, but I think this might work for now. I think this one is too dense. Just add a few edge loops here and there, the only Z modeler. Don't have to go crazy, just a little bit more. And the foot, because I might get a little more detail there. Zero Mesher has, has definitely gotten better, so I don't encounter spirals as often as I used to, so allow me to get lazy. But you think I'm lazy? You should see what the kids are doing with AI these days. Not sure why everybody's so excited to have AI replace them as concept artists, but whatever. Be curious to see what happens to the world of concept art as art directors realize they can just feed, feed ridiculous stuff in the mid journey and whatever it is. They don't need concept artists anymore, they just take up space. Right? Didn't anybody grow up hearing that old spiritual John Henry, the steel driver man? I never forgot the lessons from that story. I mean, he beat the yeah, steam engine, but he died in the end. So, this is called rambling incoherently. All right. So let's subdivide this. Dunk, dunk, dunk. I, I'm not crazy about those feet the way they look, but that's because I don't trust this reference completely. A little too blurry. Yeah, so this would be the coaxia. That's the trochanter, and that's the femur. So now I've got trochanter. Yeah, okay. So I think I need to go back in time a little bit, as Huey Lewis might say, and then uh, we'll duplicate this. And that will be our. It's going to take over this plot, spot right here, I think. The dog is going to run behind me. Groups, do the auto groups, and we have the subdivision level, so I'm going to be lazy and go into your geometry. And just to get the poly groups even on both sides, give me a weld, get some lazy. And now I can divide it and start to detail the sucker. This mother ucker, ucker, machine.
That's good, man. You got some legs. Like I said, I spent all this time on these legs, and then I could just duplicate them a few more times. And... It's a quick way to get the legs done. Fun. I think this one is going to be a lot of fun to poly paint, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to get that when I get the model pretty much in place and all the details. I'll go through my process of poly painting this in a future uh, ZBrush Live. So I do these every other Thursday. So the next one that I'm going to do is 20 something. I'll post something. Um, the 21st, I think. Let's see. Yes, uh, July 21st will be the next time I do a live session and we're going to keep working on the camel spider so you can kind of eventually see the entire process. So if you watch a couple episodes ago, episodes, whatever, um, of my live stream, if you, uh, I did do it started this Z-Sphere, so I have done the whole thing. And you can watch the whole process from the very, very beginning. Continue working on this, so I'll do a poly paint on it. And I'll do a detailing session once I get the forms, once I'm happy with the forms. I still got a lot of work to do on this underside. Um, and then I will do some heavy detailing and I'll just poly painting and we'll go through my process for doing hairs and ZBrush. So we'll do a little fiber mesh, we'll do a little insert mesh brush custom with three insert mesh brushes or whatever. So and I'm sure in future episodes I'll have to explain everything we're doing again. That's cool man. That's what it's all about. I hope you guys got some cool ideas for doing awesome arachnids. You know my workflow for doing these critters changes over the years. So my approach now is a little bit different than a few years ago. Not super different, but a little bit. Yeah, you know, the thing is, is that I remember back in the 90s, I used to watch a lot of these shows about robots, the current technology, and back then we had the Asimo robot by Honda, which was pretty cool. But all these shows are like, yeah, but look, it can't even open stairs. It can't even walk upstairs. And it can't even open a door. Now these things are doing freaking backflips. And running up and down stairs. And you can't push them down. I mean, if you can see my webpage. You can see I'm a big fan of the Boston Dynamics robot. So the thing about technology, man. <laughs> some nerd out there is going to figure it out. But that's okay. Because... You know, the world of entertainment as it is, this industry is always changing. It's always going to be different. And even in the most radical ways that we haven't even thought of yet, like we're thinking about film production and TV production in very current terms and the workflow and the pipeline. But those mediums, those artistic mediums as they stand now, I mean, just look at TikTok and YouTube and all that kind of stuff, how that's changed TV. They're going to be totally different five, ten years from now. So whatever AI concept art tools that we're using now is going to feed into that what makes it different. So you just got to roll with it. You, I can't, you know, I get frustrated sometimes. It's like, you know, it's annoying to see AI, even if it's sloppy and mushy and gushy, it still does cool stuff. And it's kind of annoying. So like, I like to do cool stuff. I don't want a robot doing my cool stuff. But you can't be a digital artist and Luddite at the same time. It's just... It's just not possible. And we do have a robot. We do have drum machines. We've had drum machines since the 80s, but we still have drummers too. Some of them are stuck on your sofa. Huh, just kidding. What do you call a drummer without a girlfriend? Homeless. Um, how do you get a guitar player to play quiet or put some sheet music in front of them? Anyways, terrible jokes. So, we'll see what happens with the AI thing, you know. I saw recently that uh, they're shipping some of those Boston Dynamics robots over to Ukraine. 
That'll be interesting. There's your Skynet right there. <laughs> There's your freaking Terminator right there, man. Those adorable puppies are going to be ripping the nards off of soldiers in the field in real time. Um, and they'll probably be operated by a 14-year-old when he knows how to roll. So I think concept art is probably the least of our worries when it comes to AI. But don't worry, Neil, De Neil deGrasse Tyson says we can just unplug it, and that will be cool. We'll take care of all our issues. And let's see, we're no batteries. Yeah, we sell drummers, but at what cost? <laughs> yeah. Um, we tried, man. We tried. Just can't get rid of them. Um, okay, the proportions. Uh, not great on those middle legs. That's okay. You got some better segments. They look better than they did before. I'm getting closer, so that'll be easy to adjust. Not something that... And I'll probably pose them differently because they look kind of goofy. So get a little bit more of a pose in there so that they look like they're actually attached to, or actually on the ground. That will help a lot in the way they look because they look kind of doofy, doofy right now. And it's okay. I can handle doofy. There's the underside. So these, the underside of these guys are not too complicated. This is kind of wild though. Look at that arrangement. That's nuts. This is why I love bugs so much. I'd never come up with this shape on my own. Maybe AI would, I don't know. But um, it's just cool. And they're so fuzzy. They just want love, just like everybody else. Okay, guys, I really enjoy you sitting here listening to me um, ramble incoherently and model a creepy, scary camel spider, sort of. I think the petty pops are looking pretty good. Maybe the feet are a little bit too big, but I don't know. I kind of like them that way. So we'll continue in the next session with the legs and the underside of this thing. See you in a couple weeks, everyone.